order at um, 6.33. Do we have any adjustments to the agenda? Okay. Um, I think we'll uh, not assign times or have a timekeeper other than we will limit public comment to three minutes person. Um, just to make sure that we have time for everybody to get to speak. Um, so uh, move on to the consent agenda. Um, we have a motion to approve the minutes of Tuesday, October 18th. So moved. I'll second. You need okay. a second? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Minutes are approved. Um, we'll move on to public comment. Do we have any public comment this time? Um, Bridget, go ahead. Hi, good I'll try to be good with my three minutes. I've fought a migraine all day, so I'm doing the best I can. Um, but since, as you all know, I have always championed performing arts here um, in the schools, I got to shout out, um, I'm obligated to shout out the uh, good folks, not just the actors, the supporters, the adults, the volunteers, the students who helped with the school play, Alice in Wonderland, which was an utter blast, but I'm also just really excited and happy to watch the school really stepping up to support. I walked by the Performance Today banner in front of the school, and it was so great to see. Um, it was wonderful to see all the promotion on Facebook. Uh, it's really nice to have a school that's proud of its student performers. It's really great to be part of a school district that embraces students as they are, that doesn't make them choose to be athletes or actors or tech folk or whatever. Um, and related, but not directly related, um, I'm also really proud of us as a district for embracing students of all shapes, sizes, race, gender identity, gender expression. Um, it's important. These kids are our kids and they're our future and we need to love them. And it's, it's incredibly frustrating to me sometimes to see people look their neighbors essentially straight in the face and say, I don't believe you. I believe a, you know, right ring radio host I listened to last week. Um, but just to be super clear, um, I'm glad we're following state guidelines. I'm glad we're following Title IX guidelines. And I'm glad we're looking out and supporting our kids, both in what they do and in who they are. Thank you. Thanks, Bridget. Um, is there anybody else who would like to speak this time? Okay, there will be a second public comment time at the end. So, Andrew, there was another oh, public comment. yes, go ahead. Uh, yes, I'm Gene Cross, and I'm a resident of Bethel. And uh, if you look at me, you might make some assumptions many of which might be absolutely wrong. Uh, there are things about me you do not know, even though you can see, uh, see some things. I was bullied as a kid in high school. Uh, I won't go into the why I think I might have been bullied, but I was. Uh, my school was not able to keep me safe. And I want to argue that no matter what, no matter who, no matter your race, gender, culture, language, educational, intellectual ability, financial status in this culture, no matter, you need to be safe. And there's our kids. And that, by the way, is not the same thing as being embarrassed or being made to feel uncomfortable. You need, as a child, to be safe, to be who you are, to not be bullied by other students, not be put down by teachers, 
to be defended from parents. It's a, it's a, it's a human right to be an individual. And so I encourage you to continue uh, with uh, the policies that you have in place and to stand firm in protecting our kids, all of them. Thank you. All right, anybody else? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Hello, I understand there's some pressure against students who are the old regimental boys and girls. They're transgender, they're gay, they're... These all have to be accepted. These people are our children, and they have to be accepted, and they can't be bullied. And they can't, we have can't arguments of where they're going to go to the bathroom or whatever. These are our children, and we want to be with them. Thank you. Could you just speak, say your name for the minutes? I'm sorry. My name is Allison Gravel from Royalton. Great. Thank you. <coughs> is there anybody else who'd like to speak at this time? I'll speak. Okay. There, my name is Acorn Swiggum. Um, I live in Randolph and have been, you know, front and center witnessing our the struggles at our school with the the disagreements about the policies on the facilities of the locker room. And not only that, but the the local election campaigners all jumping on board to voice their opinions and everything on the front porch forum and it's just been a real struggle for the young people at that school. Some of them, as a result, even if they weren't directly involved, not feeling comfortable even being at the school. And so I just wanted to, as a person from your neighboring community who knows that this is rippling out and affecting all of us, to, to voice my concern and your support to, to please continue supporting your trans students and, and following the state recommendations around supporting your trans students. Um, it's just been really painful to watch, and I don't want to see that pain spread any further. And I've also been really moved by our local community coming together to, to listen to these students and to support them. Um, and I think that, you know, part of this also is not, is trying to find dialogue and work together with, with people who may feel uncomfortable or unfamiliar with trans students, and to support people in moving through their fears and and understanding that that all of our students need to be protected from any kind of violence um, and to not apply I saw oftentimes the double standard applied where it was feared that that trans girls were predators and and people who often say that will then turn around and and not pay attention to the predation that that non-trans boys, uh, you know, when they do that to girls. And so it's just this, this real struggle that I, that I don't want to let trans girls be labeled as predators um, unfairly with no, no assessment of their actual actions. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. OK. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak at this time? Okay, uh, we'll move on to board comments. Um, anybody like to speak? Um, I did want to say, uh, Shannon had brought up the LGBTQ um, resolution last month, and that was supposed to be on the agenda this month, and I neglected to put it on, and it was just a mistake, and we will be bringing it up on in December. Um, so I am sorry that that didn't make it onto the agenda. That was an oversight. So. Um, okay, no other board members want to speak? Okay. Then we're on to the celebration of learning. 
Great. Yeah, can I introduce real quick? Of course. So I, I've had the pleasure uh, wor working with our um, performing arts boosters, our music boosters, I think is the title that they go by. And I want to apologize as well. They were hoping to be on the agenda tonight to talk about the possible expansion that we had talked about last spring that is on for a future agenda in December. Um, part of it was there was things that all got moved um, from last month into this month. So, uh, but they're gonna kick off tonight with a video on the celebration of the performing arts that's happening and then maybe give a little preview to the board about what they'll be giving a full uh, for presentation about as a possibility um, in December, which is on your agenda for a future uh, agenda item in December. Okay. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. So, hello, uh, my name is Sandy Alton. Um, thank you for having us on your agenda this evening. Um, so I am the chair of the Wildcat Music Boosters, and um, we could not be more thrilled and excited um, that music is back, right, in full swing. Um, as an advocacy group, our primary goal is to ensure that we're providing the best music program for our Bethel and South Burlington campuses, right? I mean, we think this is an ideal time to um, look at the big picture and kind of see what, you know, what lies ahead for us in our music department. So we have, as Jamie mentioned, we have put together a video montage and it's featuring um, community members, um, past and present music program students, and we ask them in one minute or less to share with us what music means to them. So I think we had like 12 or 14 videos, I think, Lori, right? And, um, but we, <laughs> thanks to Andy Smith, I think he condensed it down to about a three and a half minute video. So there's little snippets. But I think, um, Lori, or somebody will be sending you uh, maybe all 14 or 12 of them. So if, you know, I encourage you to take a look. They're, like I say, a minute or less, but they're wonderful. So anyway, are we ready to play? Let's watch. <laughs> It really cheered me up when I had a bad day, and it really improved. Uh, it's growing up, it was my whole identity. It was so important for me and for so many people I knew. It was our entire way to get our creative voices out there. I've done music and drama at Soro and Bethel uh, since I was four. Ever since elementary school, I've found music class to be the highlight of my day. And and I am currently at Castleton pursuing a music education degree. Music has been a vital part of my life ever since I started learning it back in elementary school with Kate Liptak. It taught me that I was capable of working through tough things and that it was okay to fail and to make mistakes and to work through that. I, it has impacted my life so much that I've actually uh, decided to pursue music education when I get off to college because um, it has just made me a, a more confident person, uh, more comfortable in myself, that I've actually found something that has really, you know, given me that identity that I wanted. And it really taught me how to embrace challenges and just like get excited to do things that are more and more difficult and be fine with failing along the way a lot of the times. So I love to sing and perform with my friends. Really hope that we get to have more music at our school. Even though you read music off of a page, the music isn't real until I had made the sounds. And that was, that was huge in helping me become a more independent person. And While vocal coaching the musicals, I saw hundreds of students build confidence and expertise over the years in music, drama, tech and lighting, but especially in teamwork and mutual appreciation. Um, it was just a really joyful, way to share music like within my group and like work with friends on creating something and then get to share it with a whole bunch of people. So it's a huge. From events like Pie Night and uh, from music festivals that our teacher Josh Polly single-handedly drove us to and made sure we did, um, to just having an awesome community that would support and rally behind everything we did. Um, and I couldn't speak highly enough about all of the opportunities that the music program presented to me and all the dreams that they helped me achieve. We see our town well represented at state chorus and band events where the best talents are invited. I also really enjoyed singing with my friends. Having an opportunity to have fun in my school day and connect with my peers and 
still be learning. I gained so much knowledge about people and languages and culture and history that I just would not have learned otherwise. Because their understanding of music and our heritage continues throughout their life. And listening to them perform is, is great for me and great for them. I now live in New York City and am a professional working actor here. I am part of the Broadway Asian American uh, Chorus, and I'm really loving being able to still keep music in my life as an adult and a young professional, and I owe it all to the South Royals Music Program. So I'm grateful for the wonderful opportunities and hope our music program continues to grow and reach more and more students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And please thank Andy for his assistance. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm Katie Collins, um, and I am the current vice chair of the Wildcat Music Boosters. So while there's much to celebrate within our music program, we do have some concerns that we want to share with you. Over the past few years, we've had the sense that there's been a chipping away at the music program, and these concerns do go beyond COVID. Specifically, there have been some scheduling issues with concerts and Pi Night. Last year, a concert was rescheduled last minute due to a sports game conflict, and numerous musicians who originally would have been able to attend the concert were not able to be there. The Boosters have not been able to schedule our annual Pi Night for a few years now. Um, it's a wonderful evening where any student can showcase their musical talent to the community in a relaxed coffee house setting. Um, this is actually the Booster's main fundraiser and all donations that we receive are used for scholarships for graduating seniors. Uh, students have also had some scheduling challenges. Just this year, some students are not able to take a music class due to a conflict with another class. Music is an important part of the curriculum and we need to continue to make sure there is accessibility for all. Best research shows that music excellence improves literacy and numeracy and provides students with lifelong transferable skills. And then um, another concern is that in the span of just over a year, we have lost four music educators. This turnover affects the consistency and equity that is needed for a music program to thrive. While we are excited and grateful to have our current music educators, we feel it is crucial that we provide necessary support and we continue to value excellence as we look forward to the future. I'm Laurie Smith, uh, a music mom. Um, I just wanted to zoom out from Katie's specific concerns. Uh, a number of us in the room here had the opportunity to work but to make the merger happen. Feels like eons ago, I think. Um, but I remember in all those conversations that we had over that span of time with community members, we would say, you know, we wanna have the merger, not just to bring more kids together and not just have more opportunities, but we wanna take the best of Bethel Whitcomb and the best of South Royalton, and we wanna build on that. We don't wanna take away, we wanna be building up from our strengths that we have. And as I think the video speaks to, music has always been the best of South Royalton. I know I am not alone in saying that my family considered moving a number of years ago and we decided to stay in our community because of the music program. And as Katie mentioned, since the merger, we know how hard the pandemic has been. We're incredibly grateful for our music educators, but to truly have a thriving program that is, you know, marveled throughout the state that provides these incredible opportunities for all students, we feel we need more of an institutional commitment to the whole music program, not just to celebrating the successes of the students and our talented educators, but one of the reasons we wanted to come tonight was to celebrate all that's good and all that's really hopeful in this kind of new phase of COVID, but also to ask that the board and the administration really take a look at how we can keep the promise that was made as part of the merger to take the best 
from each of our communities and, and build that into our school district today. Okay. So in closing, um, I guess this is our call to action um, on you as a board. We would like to ask um, that you commit or make an institutional commitment, if you will, um, throughout our music program. Um, we'd like to see a multi-year plan, a draft, um, crafted by the music educators and the administration. Um, this draft, this plan um, would ensure that the opportunity exists for all, that there's equity access for all students who are interested in being involved with the music program. I mean, I think this is vital. Um, this is what we've promised. Um, our schools benefit tremendously from a thriving and robust music program. And it is an, it's, it, it's, as you can see, um, it is such a value to our community. I mean, we have this, um, this reputation of being, you know, an excellent music community. We have amazing musicians. We have amazing um, music educators. Um, and so I think the time is right. It's, it's now. It's right. We have, um, we, we've emerged, um, arguably emerged, we're certainly emerging from COVID. We have um, two new music educators. We have a new high school principal. Um, we have a wonderful activities director who's been very supportive. I think the time is now and we owe it to our, to our students um, to ensure, again, that, um, and, and commit to ensuring that they have the best music program. Um, plain and simple. So that's our ask. That's our request. And um, thank you again for for having us on the yes, agenda. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I just had just yeah, a couple follow-up questions. Just, again, new board member too. Mm -hmm. So forgive me if it's something that I should know. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, so when you, when you were talking about um, scheduling conflicts, yes. at, at what age level are we talking? Is this high school or? or which building or yeah so specifically <clears throat> I think some one of you mentioned there are five currently That's at the five. high school mm -hmm. that um, are not able to take a music class because of a conflict or uh, okay five different but then you mentioned the individual events that oh, have been canceled okay. or yes. or changed is that this yes. year or that last year so that was last and what, spring and that at what level was that at That's at the high school level okay and yeah Pine Night benefits is for it's every community. Pine Night is for the community, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. 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 And musicians of all ages mm -hmm. participate yeah. in that. And have you tried to, um, sorry, have, just, have, uh, you, have you tried to schedule an event this year in that case? I'm just trying to get, like, yeah, no, I think where I'm coming from good. is, we have, you know, we, we have a change mm -hmm. of administrator here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I'm trying to figure out, is this last year, is this this year, you know, you know how do we... we Work yeah, we do have that. a lot to celebrate, and I think we're very encouraged mm -hmm. by the new team in yeah. place, quite honestly. And in all honesty, we started this process, the Music Boosters and this team um, specifically, back at the end of the school year. Um, and so since then, a lot has, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, a lot has, right. has turned. Um, mm -hmm. But again, we just want to ensure that we don't take, we don't fall backwards. We need to keep moving ahead. And yes, yeah, so to answer your question, some of those were last year. Um, and they benefit, as Lori mentioned, not only the community, but in a couple of these particular cases, the high school students. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, yeah, our, our goal is to keep moving forward and to continue this path of excellence and not fall back. And, and obviously, I can't help you on last year, but yeah. right. I, mean, it, I guess if there was issues that we're having currently, mm -hmm. you know, if you had those and you know that's something mm -hmm. that the board could work with to make sure that sure you know that we can move forward yeah. successfully yeah um, I think I think that's why we're thinking in terms of like if if there is <clears throat> a, almost like a, a music strategic plan yeah. or a, yeah. or a you know a three to five year like what what is required to have excellence in the music program and it, it it doesn't really, you can't, because it's year over year, you know, these students are so committed to, mm -hmm. to learning music for so many years. It, it doesn't really work one year to be like, oh, well, we're tight on our schedule this year, so we're really, we really need to kind of like not offer chorus to whatever right. grade. Or, you know, it, it um, if it is genuinely one of, you know, one of the values of this school district, 
having some sort of plan for excellence and access feels like a, a much um, a much better way to to move toward excellence and to and to make sure that we're kind of guaranteeing excellence mm -hmm. rather than just decision making. Oh well, this year was rough because we didn't get support from you know mm -hmm. in the schedule with the conflict with softball but this year was good you know we're, we're we're looking for a more we're hoping for a more systematic approach to maintain the value and maintain the excellence that that we've been fortunate to experience for a long time i think it also has to do with the fact that music is part of the curriculum mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i know when that you know just we just don't want to see something like extracurriculars you know taking precedence over say it was a concert like that was scheduled and stuff like that mm -hmm. so like Lori said um, just coming up with a plan that will ensure that everybody has equal access to music mm -hmm. programs um, and to continue to move forward I will say we feel like we're sitting in a great place right now right. the activities mm -hmm. director's been amazing mm -hmm. um, the new principal has been amazing <laughs> um, and it's finally feeling good to have that support right. okay. and to see that so we just want to ensure that that continues okay Andrew. i would just add that um i think last year was hard because there's a lot of fits and starts but it would be even be able to have an elementary concert and i know we had an elementary concert that happened to be on the same night as like a senior softball game or a senior something and it was like oh my gosh so the previous athletic director and josh Polly and i sat down and we planned out all the concerts not finite <laughs> that we knew of for the rest of the year so that at least the high school sports and the limited parking wouldn't be conflicting with all the concerts for the middle school and the high school and elementaries. But not tiny. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, that's, okay. that's why we're asking for yeah. more of an institutional commitment from <clears throat> elementary school right on up through high school. Um, it, and and we, we, like Lori mentioned too, some kind of a plan, a three to five year plan that again is worked on by the administration and the music educators to ensure mm -hmm. that this program stays for a long time and that and that excellence is valued. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will say, you know, I, I, I do think we've been trying to push, you know, like when we set up the activities director and he was the co-curricular director, mm -hmm. you know, we weren't making an athletic director position that right. we then, you know, we're right. trying to make it so that each side was equally valued. Mm -hmm. And so, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah very that's, much. that's wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Speaking for myself, at least, you know, I think mm -hmm. we share these values and yeah. you know, mm -hmm. want to see this continue. Um, does the administration have any, you want to speak to this at all? Yeah, I mean, I, Jeff and I have met with the Music Boosters. Mm -hmm. I've been meeting, I've met with the uh, group that's working on the Performing Arts Lab mm -hmm. expansion. Um, I think that we're all, we all want the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that, you know, the key is going to be that we just continue to move forward around defining what excellence is. Um, and certainly, you know, the goal would be to bring some stability to our music programming. I think one of the things we struggle with in the SU in general is some turnover in music teachers in my part-time positions in some of our sending districts, which also poses a challenge, I think, when we think about the hub being our unified middle and high school where we're trying hard. Jeff just is getting here from a recruitment effort on our Wildcat night. Um, to just make certain that those proficiencies and expectations are consistent. So one of the things we are doing this year too, and I had shared with the Music Boosters, is that our music teachers are meeting in a professional learning collaborative on a regular basis to really define what is it that we want students to know, understand, and do at the end of every grade level cluster. Um, and so that works underway as we revise all of our curricular documents, but I think that work goes in part of the strategic plan. I also think the conversation we'll have next month about facility space and the proposal around what could be possible um, to provide uh, a performing arts lab for students to access. Um, and then the real emphasis, and I think there's little notes, I was able to go to the um, performance on Saturday of our drama performance. And I think it, I hope that the public sees the reinforcement around our activities director being there and present, that was that was a conscious effort to say that that is as important as any other sporting event. So I would just share certainly from the top know that that, that is work that's underway too and that we share it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very great. much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I was going to highlight the performance was 
amazing this weekend. And <laughs> one of the things I think that makes our, our district special is that there were students performing in our, our performance this weekend of Alice in Wonderland who also had other extracurriculars they were in, that they were involved in um, in regards to athletics and things of that nature. And as someone who has um, stepchildren in another larger district, um, that wouldn't be possible, meaning they have to choose. Um, they're not allowed to do drama and a sport because there's just too much conflict and it would be really hard to be able to participate in a sport at that level if they chose drama. So I just, I, I really came away there just once again as someone who went through South Royalton in a small school setting. I think you take that for granted sometimes. And I think that's something that we should highlight and showcase more as well as a, dist as a district that you do get to participate in multiple things. And I'll say with those performers participating in multiple things, man, they were spot on, and I would put that act up against any other surrounding <laughs> schools. I didn't see any lines messed up at all, and, and they did a much better job than I did in Guys and Dolls. <laughs> <laughs> and I would add, not to get into the weeds on the, it sounds like five students who can't get into music because of scheduling conflicts, but from a resource standpoint, if they have things that they need to take and are not able to take because they want music and they have to get a science or a history. You know, from resource standpoint, I would hope that we could make something available. We have online resources, we have classes, we have, so I feel awful because that they're missing music, which you really have to do in person right. for exactly. something that maybe they could take <clears throat> online after school or before school. So, um, but if, if there's any resources that we can make available, I would. Well, and I think, and that, speaks, that speaks to, I, I, in my opinion, guidance. I mean, I know one student in particular who, it was kind of a last minute, and she was very disappointed that she couldn't take, I don't know if it was band or chorus, um, but there wasn't, and I know that that exists, but I know because I'm involved, and I don't, you know, not everyone is aware. And so mm -hmm. how do we make sure we reach those particular students? Because she just walked away, and after, I only found out, you know, three months into school, I was like, you, there, there could have been another option. So we need to make sure that if a student, if, if, if it's known that a student has to drop a class, we need to be proactive with that student and say, okay, th these are your options. You don't have to drop this if you can do A or B. So that's that would be my concern. But I, yeah, I appreciate that. And thank you for bringing that up because it reminded me of my conversation with her. I mean, I would think that if we do have some sort of conflict that that would be an opportune mm -hmm. time for the guidance counselors to be involved and for help sure. remap that for them right for it could sure. be yeah. could be an elective that they could take right next year the year after mm -hmm. so that they could be involved in music so maybe that would be just kind of a default to a guidance counselor to try to work through that the flexible pathways yeah you know, that's yeah. a big yeah, reason true. for yeah. it so but again, if it's, a, if it's sort of a siloed thing where music is just really the job of the music educators, it's harder. And so, some sort of mechanism for planning and well, how, how do we how do we communicate and how do we how do we schedule music classes and things like that? Like, I think I think if the conversation is broader and more of an institutional nature, I think that will that will help move forward those things, mm -hmm. like like that it would be on the counselor's radar screen and yeah. things like that. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I remember when I was in high school, ninth and 10th grade in Windsor, when I was in high school, a long time ago, was, um, you know, you had to have band or chorus, ninth to 10th grade, you had to choose one or the other, or you could do both. Mm -hmm. um, but that, you know, it seems like now that's a, more of a choice rather than, you know, it was part of the educational process. When well, I was there are school. many students that want to do both. Exactly. And I think that's, that's, that's hard, but, you know, making that choice, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, they actually they don't the, have to choose. The last time I was at a board meeting, I think it was because we realized that the schedule at that yes. time only had seven periods in it and there were and and that it didn't allow musicians to fulfill sort of a college prep pathway and also do band and chorus and that to is. read McCracken's credit he sort yeah. of engaged students and parents and educators in a really lengthy process that landed at the schedule they have now mm -hmm. with with the four different class periods so that was really a great um, 
a great opportunity for people to speak up. But I know I will say every year I hear from my son like, I don't know, mom, I hear they're changing the schedule. I hear we're going back to seven. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm going to do, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, it, is, mm -hmm. it is an ongoing concern. And I think, again, having some sort of a, a, a like a clear pathway would help help allay that concern and, and just um, do more to support that ongoing access. OK, um, thank you. Um, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yes. Move to the reports. Um, Bridget, I saw your hand was up. Would you mind holding um, till public comment? Uh, it was um, addressing what we were talking about, which is the only reason I did it. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, reports to the board. So you have my report in hand. A couple quick things I wanted to add. Uh, one, I'm excited that we're going to be rolling out through our community schools grant, um, something that we're going to be uh, coined community conversations. And so those will be happening once a month, um, the second Wednesday of the month from 5.30 to 7. The first one will be in um, South Royalton, and it's going to be focused on personalized learning and pathways. Our personalized learning and pathways folks across the SU are going to be coming together um, to offer a conversation and just have dialogue with our community and stakeholders in regards to what's working well, what folks may have in regards to uh, focus around improvement of the process that we have around personalized learning and pathways, and our folks just are still trying to wrap their heads around what does that mean for my grandchild or child. Um, and so that's going to be happening in December. We'll have dinner from 530 to 6, and we'll have a hybrid model where folks could join us virtually if they want. Um, but also have uh, in-person conversation. So there's going to be different topics every month, and we will host in each district across the SU. So I just wanted to highlight that. That information will be coming out for me the first of next week to the community. Uh, also, just a reminder that we were recipients of an EPA grant for electric buses um, that totaled just over $1.1 million and $60,000 in infrastructure. That was an SU grant. Uh, we, it was spearheaded by um, Two Rivers out of Quichi, uh, which services our towns within our supervisory union of Stratford and Sharon. So my sense is that, that those vehicles will discuss this next Tuesday at the full board meeting, but would be housed at those two districts as their primary transportation vehicles. Um, and that there would be infrastructure set up in Sharon. Um, our remember, reminder, we don't own our own buses. Uh, we contract transportation services. So the way that that would work is that the SU would um, lease those vehicles to whatever transportation service provider we contract with moving forward. Right now we're with Butler's. Uh, we are up for bid for the next uh, several years. And um, certainly that piece would be a consideration within the contract and bids we get. That RFP is going out. Um, and we would also receive, um, so that the whatever transportation company we go with, just to give a quick highlight, they would then um, also pay us back for the electricity used to charge the vehicles. And they would be, um, they would take on the cost of maintenance um, and upkeep, just like they currently do with the fleet that we have that's a diesel fleet. And we would still have diesel buses available to our member districts too um, mm -hmm. when we're not using electric buses. And then I also just wanted to highlight in the report um, that we have uh, partnered with Tri-Valley Transit. Um, and you do have students <coughs> specifically in RUD accessing and utilizing that tra public transportation in order to access after school um, activities. Uh, I'm really proud, Principal Bradley's not with us tonight, but we have um, 75 students currently enrolled through our community schools grant in middle school after school programming, which is significant when you look at after school programming numbers um, compared to those districts across the state. My, I myself tried to start one in Williamstown and, and struggled mightily. So I think there's a lot we can learn and glean from what's happening here um, in regards to our after school programming at the Bethel campus, and we're certainly going to be using that for one of our community conversations as we look to expand more middle school programming to our other member districts as well. Um, and I'll take any questions folks may have. There's a bunch of other topics we'll hit on 
throughout the board meeting. So with the, the EPA grant with electric buses, so even though um, even though the state will be guaranteeing them for a period of time and doing maintenance and things like that, will we still collect that information so that we can use that going it won't forward? Won't be the as, state, or it would be our contracted service okay. provider. Okay, but will we have data? So I'm, I don't just you know if it costs X amount to 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 um, you know maintenance or or keep running, will we be able to have that data or are we? Or not. I don't think there's any good data because I believe there's only two SUs right now that have electrical vehicles in their fleet and it's pretty recent. But it is data that I asked Butler to be able to provide and they're joining us next Tuesday. Okay. Okay. Uh, anything else for doing? Okay, move on to the principals. So you have our report, and we also have a academic. Sorry, she's on to talking. We have our uh, academic um, report as well. So I don't know if we can probably start with a, our general report. Yeah. Uh, the the biggest thing, um, well, it's, it's, there's a lot of pictures, but the biggest thing I want to highlight is um, on the Bethel campus last year. Kathy Fector started partnering with the Bethel Food Shelf. Uh, her class was wanted to do some service learning, so they were making pies um, for the food shelf. So this year it's expanded. She's we have the whole school, the whole elementary school, is making pies to donate to the food shelf and for our um, our feasts that we're having on each campus. So lots of pies being made here and lots of pies being donated to the Bethel Food Shelf, which feels really nice. Um, so we're excited about that partnership. So to highlight at the high school, we've had uh, a few recruiting trips. We went to Chelsea the other night with a recruiting team and uh, met with several families. And tonight we had another uh, We Are Wildcat night. And um, it was interesting to see some of the several families we met in Chelsea at our uh, campus tonight. Um, so we, this week, yesterday, seems like a long time ago, but yesterday, we had a veterans celebration. And we had about uh, nine veterans come in. And we had three of them speak to our um, students, and the band played, and the chorus was there. Um, and uh, what else has happened? Um, our pathways, flexible pathways, are um, just really buzzing. We have, um, we're now expanding a little bit, where one of our students, high school students, is uh, working with a fifth grade student, and I think that's really kind of neat. We had a storyteller in today, and uh, the elementary from both campuses were there in the morning, and then in the afternoon, he did the Odyssey for the high school. So lots of things going on to build a great community. Yeah. And then Anda, I don't know, Anda's here to help with the academic benchmark report, but I don't know if she wants to talk or she wants us to talk. That's uh, you can kick off. You want to kick off? Yeah. Yeah. Start off. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was looking for you to give an overview and then Sorry. that's all right. Andrew could go over elementary and then you and I could could uh, tackle the middle school and Jeff can speak to the high school data. Yeah. yeah. Sorry not to be able to be there in person, um, but I, uh, so you've got um, in front of you there the uh, academic um, data report, benchmark report for the fall. So these are assessments that uh, first through eighth graders took in October. Uh, and this is for the White River Valley schools. This is a new assessment for them this year. Um, and so this replaces, you may be familiar, remembering STAR 360, um, but this is replaces STAR, STAR 360. We piloted it in, in two of our districts last year. Uh, got a lot of good feedback on what was, you know, what people found helpful about it, how usable it was in terms of um, informing instruction, which is our number one goal with data, is to make changes, uh, you know, in the classroom with what is happening based on what students uh, show and know they um, are able to do. So we um, found that a lot of our teachers were responding that they really could use this data in the way that the assessment was set up, so they could look at the individual questions that students were answering, you know, which ones they got 
correct, which ones they got wrong. Um, sometimes there's questions that have multiple correct answers. Um, and so, you know, our students are maybe used to only selecting one. And so just be really helping them think through how do you read closely, uh, know that there might be more than one answer for a certain kind of question, seeing how long uh, students take with questions. Um, and then also as, as with STAR 360, it's a computer adaptive test. And, uh, and that it really gets at um, sort of in a limited number of questions, no more than 30, that you're really trying to figure out exactly what students have mastered and what they're still working on. Um, and so questions will get easier and harder depending on how you answer them. And we've we've heard that students um, say that when we ask them how the assessment went, the, the, some of them were like, oh, it's, it was easy and hard. Or, you know, it was it was fun and I learned uh, new things and then it got easy and then it got hard again. And so you can hear like they are actually experiencing that um, that computer adapting to what they're learning and, and trying to target and write on the question. So um, all of that has been has been good. And we will do this as this assessment, this track my progress in math and English language arts again in January to get a kind of a winter benchmark. And then again in April to get a, our spring benchmark. So those will be the next two times that will, our students will experience this and we'll have our kindergartners join uh, the assessment in January and have their first uh, try it um, at this. Uh, and they have, they're able to listen to all the questions being asked um, using headphones. And so that's helpful for all of our students um, to have that sort of audio support on, on the questions, but that's sort of the overall. So I will, um, yeah, I'll pass it over to, to Andrew to talk more about the what's going on with the elementary and what they're learning about it as they look at the data as, as um, sort of as a school uh, and grade level cohorts. Yeah, so I would say uh, a few weeks ago we sat down and it's just learning a new test and how, how it works. Um, so we sat down with Onda actually and we were able to still look at this data versus our previous data and it's all trending the same way, no big surprises. Um, we know we have a lot, lot of catch up to do from COVID, and um, and so I would summarize what we're doing with that is education of teachers. We're doing a lot of teacher education, a lot of focus on uh, math education during our staff meetings, during our half days. The SU offers two um, UVM, not UVM, two courses, uh, college level courses, and. So we are training up our special educators and our interventionists a little deeper on how to react when kids are not making um, the gains that we're looking to. We're using some new specialized programs that we hadn't used before. Um, so it's, it's going to take time, but I feel like uh, the level of knowledge of our teachers is getting deeper and deeper, and I think it's only helping our population. So that's, I mean, in general, I would say that's the, the answer to both the literacy and math scores and how we're doing. And then I'll jump in on that, and, and you can jump in after that. I mean, I think a, a couple things to remind the board. Our work in literacy around our, our expansion of Fountas and Pinnell materials across the SU had come in the year pro just prior to my starting. And so that work, is, I'm in going into year three. So that year, that work is going into year four. One of the things we've identified in our data and literacy across the SU is that we're still seeing gaps in phonemic awareness and, and phonics. And so the White River Unified District is tackling that through an approach called Foundations, which, which has explicit instruction in phonics, which will support students with decoding, like understanding blends and digraphs and syllable types for students, but also in encoding, and so that's spelling, right? And so we're also, all of our interventionists right now are engaged in something called Lead to Read, which is professional development with the Stern Center. Some of our classroom teachers are involved in professional development with the Stern Center for Language and Learning right now as well. Um, but they are also doing something called the Dibbles Assessment, which also is focusing on giving us data that's even deeper than this in regards to gaps in phonics. And so I share that with you to just give one example of where we are still using our Fountas and Pinnell materials. They are great materials in the approach around a literacy block and having guided reading groups. It's all good work that we needed to do, but we also identified that wasn't enough. And so what we've done is we've implemented foundations and then a Hegarty approach around phonemic awareness that we're implementing in all of our elementary classrooms. And it's a, it's a consistent approach across both of your elementary campuses, and we're expecting all of our elementary teachers to implement that. 
I say that because that same example of a strategic approach to literacy, we are only in year two with in regards to mathematics. And so you had no common math materials in one of your campuses going into last year. We had kind of some different approaches and you definitely didn't have common math materials across your two campuses. And so we went with Envision Math Materials. Again, I say materials because a program that we purchase, and those are materials to get to our ends, that's not our curriculum, right? And we need to be really clear about what we want students to know, understand, and do. And when I talked about the unveiling of an elementary wide report card, that is to get really clear about what are the expectations we set forth in our curriculum that we want students to know, understand, and do at the end of every grade level. And so that's what students will be receiving and what parents will get to talk about and learn about throughout the upcoming year is what are those grade level expectations and when we report on them as educators then it means that we know them at a deeper level and that we're teaching them right because a report card is a is a communication tool of what we expect and what we teach and so in regards to mathematics we just purchased a new approach which i'm going to ask on a uh, new program which i want on to be able to speak to because i can't remember the name of it for middle school level and on has been meeting with our middle school level uh, math teachers one of the things um, in regards to middle school math scores that you can see here is we are at, we are concerned <laughs> and we were concerned last year we continue to be concerned about the cliff that we're seeing in regards to mathematics at the middle school. I would tell you that that assessment's not just measuring middle school though, it's a measuring all the standards leading up to middle school. And so we're a team in this. We understand we have gaps in regards to our mathematical understanding. We have to fill those gaps. One of the things we're looking at as well and trying to learn from is, you know, what are we seeing around math data across our other districts in our SU? Because we have three middle schools, right? And so what are we seeing for growth? And what, what can we learn from each other in regards to mathematics as a cohort of teachers across the SU? And, and we do have teachers diving into deeper professional development and mathematics, just like I was speaking to in regards to literacy through the Vermont, the VMI, the Vermont Math Initiative. Um, and so, Andrew, do you want to speak to what that new material and program is that we're using at the middle school? Because I can't remember the name of it. Yeah, no, and it's good because it, so it's called Open Up Resources Math. Uh, our it kind of shortens to our math, um, and it is an open like open resource curriculum that you or and materials that you can get online. Um, and we have purchased also the the kind of the hard copy materials, knowing that that's um, for a lot of our students that's the best way to learn. And it's uh, inquiry based math. Um, which really, you know, focuses on those mathematical practices that we want students to be able to build their skills around how they're tackling um, kind of the conceptual, the procedural, and um, their problem-solving skills. And so, um, it is not, you know, it is, it is not, it is aligned with Envision's math in terms of the thing, the concepts won't be entirely different for students who are coming out of our fifth grade and heading into sixth grade. Um, but it is a fairly new resource for our teachers, and um, they did professional development over the summer to become more familiar with it, but it, it, will be, it will be a bit of a learning curve this year as they figure out um, exactly how to utilize the different parts of the program um, and use them with the, their students um, in the math block each day. So we are, yeah, we are meeting actually to, again tomorrow morning um, to talk about uh, how we can continue to support the math teachers. We also have a math interventionist who's full-time in the middle school um, who'll be part of those conversations as well to um, think about really how do we address where we're seeing these gaps in their understand in student understanding at key concepts in middle school, um, so that we can be really working on, on shoring those up um, by the end of eighth grade. And then I'll just jump in. I mean, the other thing we're looking at, and I think to just to put it out there is I we are looking at instructional minutes. And so one of the things that I, I think we have concern about right now in regards to when we look at instructional minutes currently of our middle school schedule. The explicit instructional minutes in mathematics is less than we have in some of our other middle schools throughout the SU. And so I say that because what we find in research and what I think we find with schools that are doing more interdisciplinary work, that mathematics is a really hard concept to bring in to interdisciplinary work. And so last month we got a celebration of learning about our pod time 
which we all celebrate. I think there's good things happening. I think being able to link mathematical proficiencies to interdisciplinary units of study is mighty difficult. And many districts that do inter interdisciplinary work often will say we're going to have X amount of explicit minutes with math instruction daily. And so we have explicit minutes of math instruction daily. The problem is we're looking at the fact that we may need to expand those minutes. Um, and so I just want to highlight that to the board that that is something that we have identified and that we also plan to tackle when we think about scheduling for next year. Um, and you know, when you think about interdisciplinary units of study, it's much easier to get at proficiencies around close, close reading, like meaning nonfiction texts and explicit writing when you're doing inter interdisciplinary units of study versus I'm going to work on fractional reasoning, decimals, and percent. That's much harder when we're thinking about project-based learning and getting into those deeper concepts around mathematics. The other thing that I think we're going to be looking to push on is an SU when we do our curriculum revision, and it's something Anda's heard me talk about. My goal would be that our expectations are that 80% of our students are ready and accessing Algebra 1 by 8th grade. And the reasoning for that is, is I believe that that sets us up, one, around the standards and expectations that we see these, that the Common Core State Standards measure in middle school math, but two, if we want our students to have the opportunity to meet calculus at the secondary level without doubling up in mathematics, you really need to have Algebra 1 at eighth grade. So I do believe that that will lift up our expectations as well. From a curricular standpoint, if that is really our goal, doesn't mean all have to get there, right? But if we could set a goal that by the at, within five years that we have 80% of our students prepared and ready to access, I think that's going to lift up our math expectations in general across all grades. So I share that as work that's happening, and um, and to just say to you that we're using this data to inform instruction, but also for strategic planning. I have questions. Yep. So it's somewhat reassuring to me to look at the English scores per grade level. We need to get better, but it's not as clear cut as these math scores that you have 4% of your kiddos in first grade well below expected, and that's up to by the time they get through fifth grade up to 40%, I think we have some problems in the elementary too. They're falling behind. I mean, it's very clear from this graph. You, you don't have to be a scientist to read that they're falling further behind every year instead of keeping up. Whereas in English, it looks like we're not making great gains, but we're at least keeping up. Um, I worry a little bit about what are we going to do this year? It's November. We still have a whole nother semester and we're talking, I'm hearing Onda say, it's kind of a year where we're figuring things out. That's great, but we've got kids falling further and further behind now. And we have to remember that there's a couple hundred kids out there counting on us to get them through math just this year. So what's, what's happening this year to address this? Onda raised right. your hand, yeah. Go ahead, Anna. Onda. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no, I appreciate you bringing that up. So I think two points. So one, we are we are certainly doing stuff this year. Um, we have lots of work going on. I, I was presenting just as we've gone through with other new materials that there is, you know, there, there, will, there will be a learning curve to some of the some of the um, understanding of exactly how to utilize the materials in the most effective way for all of our students. Um, and that's sort of ongoing support of the teachers while, you know, while they're using it with, with students. But we've been in the, the math classrooms. There's certainly, you know, um, I think high, high level math instruction going on in, in the middle school math classrooms. Um, and we'll continue to continue to support those teachers. Um, on the on the first grade graph, I actually am really encouraged by this graph because I I think this shows a um, I think this shows what is effectively happening in our pre K and K classrooms, which is not necessarily a place where we have had um, sort of this you know a, a unified approach to to math instruction. Um, and I think you know we we actually looked at this data. I was with the pre K K and first grade teachers all together as we were looking at it, and the first grade teachers were saying like God like 
this is this is looking really good. Why like why do you think this is? Because this this is certainly bucking a sort of a national trend where math has not um, has fallen further behind uh, English language arts with COVID, and there's probably a, there's a lot of good reasons for that especially given you know where most families are probably more comfortable supporting literacy than they are in math in general um but i think we have a lot of really good work going on in our pre-k and kindergarten classrooms around math instruction and i think that's starting you're starting we're starting to see that reflected in this data um with those with those students in first grade right now um so rather than falling off i'm hoping we'll see that sort of that line push through the grade levels as it goes through um as that cohort moves through um while also working with the current you know, second through uh, eighth graders and, and closing those gaps. But I do, I'm, I, I am more encouraged by the, the first grade line than anything on that. I would just also add in the elementary, the last couple of years we haven't been able to do this because we had to pod, um, but our upper level elementary teachers have uh, wanted to, instead of teaching a class all things, um, they are specializing. So. Jamie Rainville is teaching all the math for fourth and fifth graders. And um, and so I think, you know, it's her passion. She's good at it. And I do think that with people specializing, we're going to see big changes. And I think, you know, to answer your question too, Shannon, the other thing we're doing is our interventionists aren't just literacy interventionists. They're also math interventionists. So we're looking deeper into this at specific kids and saying, okay, this kid needs a boost and how are we gonna boost them? We're gonna do small group instruction, pulled out. What do they need? And we're trying to just really target it. So uh, I, it, we are doing things. It takes a second though. But. Yeah. Is there any way to increase, I'm thinking specifically in the middle school where we've talked about increasing minutes to do it this year instead of waiting and switching schedules around just for next year? I would say possibly. I mean, for the next semester. It's really a principal question. Yeah, I know. And it's he's not, not here. It's not my. Here, so. It's not a Jamie question, but so I would answer that as possibly. I, I, I don't rule out anything, but it it's really is a principle. Yeah. Just middle school also operates on trimesters. Yep. Um, on the interventionist side of things, like if you think the interventionists are basically supposed to be targeting these people who are in the lo lower blocks, like how do you do it when you have 66% of the students? It's really about universal instruction. So right. what, I, what I would say is the same thing I said to a district that had one cohort they were really concerned about. Um, previously, this, this uh, at a prior board meeting is, it's going to be about high quality universal instruction. And I would say to you, one of the things that we've gotten explicit about is that math has to be taught a minimum of an hour a day. And what we were finding around time audits across our SU at our elementary levels is that wasn't happening. And it's not, I don't mean it in any critical sense, I just mean it in the sense of research shows we have to do it five days a week for a minimum of an hour. And so as we think about differentiating math and being able to pull small groups after you deliver your whole group instruction to coach students, it really takes a minimum of an hour to get through a whole math lesson. So one of the things that I'm really hopeful that you'll see is, is that we will see growth from this assessment to the next because we're implementing that hour long math block. Instead of having it chipped away at 45 minutes on a Wednesday, and maybe it's only 30 minutes on a Thursday. As an SU, we got really explicit about literacy, has to be a minimum of 90 minutes. I would say the explicit expectations around it has to be a minimum of 60 minutes of math is really taking hold this year. But yeah, you're right. You, there's no way to intervene out of these, this data. It has to be done at the universal level. And I know, I know when we usually are looking at standardized test scores, it's, you know, is it, are we teaching to the test? Are we not teaching to the test? How does that, you know, um, you know, just because we're maybe more deficient, does that mean that our children really are deficient or are they just not working to the test? But I think <clears throat> out of all the ones I've ever looked at, this, this assessment here was probably the easiest. Like I think that Shannon was trying to allude to was regardless of are we teaching to the test or not teaching to the test, it clearly shows that our deficiencies in math grow from first grade to eighth grade. So there is a tr there's a very simple, easy trend to look at there. And then on the literacy end of things, 
if we're low, middle, or high. We don't know, but but we're consistent. So you know, you can see from first grade to eighth grade that those test scores all kind of line up consistently. So um, you know, I guess depending on you know, I guess we don't really know exactly because it's a new test where we land, but we can see the trends. You know, usually you get this and you'll see the trends are all over the place and there is no real trend, but here you can clearly see the deficiency in math grows over time. Um, yeah, and thank, and Chris, one of the things I think we value about why and why we went to this assessment is the ease of being able to have teachers get in and look at what standards students are lacking in, mm. both yeah. individually and as cohorts, right? Like, You've heard us talk, at least heard me talk now for a while, and Andrea, about foundational skills in reading. Well, if you look at our assessment and literacy, that's an area of concern in this district, but in the SU, I would say that, that even shines a brighter light when you see our SUY data um, on Tuesday, is that is an area that, that's really highlighted when you break out um, the different domains of the assessment. And so, I'm hopeful that as we use this assessment over time, that you'll, in the board, you'll continue to get this, that those domains where you see that we have weaknesses, that you'll see us over time strengthen those areas because that's where we're putting focus work in, both prof through professional development, through resources provided to teachers, but then also teachers putting time in to really hone their craft in those areas. I just also say, um, Andra and Jeff and, and Owen, who's not here. Um, I, don't, I don't envy you your jobs because we just all said how much we value the music program. And now we're saying teach more math. And I'll point out that students who take music often get better math scores. But teaching all the things all the time is not easy to do. <laughs> and finding the minutes in the day. So it's a balancing act and I don't, I don't envy it. So, but thank you. Um, one thing I'm wondering about is, you know, we frequently talk about not wanting to put things in the budget that we're going to have to, like, take away later. But when we have scores like this, does it make sense to have, like, an extra interventionist for two years to try and, you know, blitz us or whatever and really try and make a difference on these kids who are going to be going from, you know, the kids who are in our sixth, seventh, and eighth grade are going to be our high school in a few years. And so, like, would it make sense to try and, you know, we do have a surplus coming up and, like, try Yeah, to I can take that back to the things. principals and find out. I would say the other thing that I think would be helpful for the administration is that the board gives us a hard charge on making certain we are explicitly teaching math. Okay. Because I don't, I don't want to speak for the principals, but certainly where I sit as a superintendent, that is an area where I think I can hit barriers. And I do think it's with competing interests at times. And, and by competing interests, I'm talking about interdisciplinary units of study. I'm talking about making certain we have all of our essentials, talking about that we have outdoor ed time. And having the board give a directive to me that, that we are explicitly teaching mathematics a minimum number of minutes a week and possibly added intervention. I would want to talk to the principals to talk about like capacity if we were actually fully staffed with interventionists. Is that going to be helpful or not? Because remember, we're still not fully staffed with interventionists right now. Yeah. That a difference. But I can tell you certainly where I sit, and I'm looking at Andrea because she's been here with me for a while now, three years, a real directive from the board around mathematics instruction and a priority around explicit instruction is a helpful tool for us sometimes when we navigate those competing interests because they happen right and they're all for good reasons but just getting really clear around it i think could be really powerful so if we did you know blitz the sixth seventh and eighth graders because that seems to be you know the area um i mean is that an actual uh, goal that can be accomplished I, you know i mean we can put whatever in the budget but if we can't hire somebody you know it, it doesn't we mean do that. so is there the opportunity to fill right those? Now doing intervention at our middle school but if so, we if we all of a sudden you know added an extra one or two, like two? for I think two key, years is is there the ability to get high quality individuals out there to do that 
Yeah, possibly, right? I can't guarantee it. Mm -hmm. I think the other key piece to it is we don't want to pull kids out of universal instruction to intervene. I mean, I don't want to pull them out of a class in order to provide intervention. So the problem, like with these theories, all right, I don't want a student to miss first universal instruction with their math teacher or their ELE teacher to get math intervention. And so I want math intervention to happen at the end of a longer block when the teacher goes into coach mode. So think about a lot of us have experiences in reading of a teacher working with a small group doing guided reading, right? Even most of us sitting in this room. Well, we worked on independent read to self or some type of re uh, reading response. What we want to get is to a place in our math instruction where that math teacher can also go into coach mode and pull small groups of students. While students are practicing at their level, the math, the math instructional place that they're at so that we could double dip, meaning the student would get a warm-up routine, they get whole group instruction, they, they would get to work with their classroom teacher and also get intervention. How do you do that? It probably takes a 75 minute block to really get to where we want to get to. What I would say to you now is if you said to me you have two math interventions at the middle school, I don't know how to right now not pull students out of universal instruction with a teacher with two people doing it, right? I'm, what I'm saying is I don't have a schedule that allows us to have two people doing math intervention and not have them also miss first instruction. So I don't have that answer right now. Doesn't mean we couldn't work on a schedule that increases that ability. Just right now, I don't know how to do that. Um, one thing that I remember you guys talking about over the COVID time was utilizing the after school programs to really provide targeted supports. Is that, I know like we've got these club things that are going on at the middle school, which is great, but like, would it be possible to do some of that? Yeah, and, and I need to check in to see. I don't know, but no, required. it's a great idea, and I got to check in to see if we are and if we're not, why, and ask that question. Yeah, it, I I do like the um, this report is like the the view of the grades lined up is great, and the the seeing from the fall to the fall is also very helpful to kind of see the progress, although I realize those are two different um, scores. It would be interesting to see, like for the winter one, like the kids that are receiving intervention, like how do they progress compared to the kids who aren't or whatever. And, you know, kind of to see how what we're trying to do to fix things is, is working. Um, yeah, I don't know. But I, I do like this report format. Um, so just some feedback. At the end of the day, I think we're a school and we need to teach math. So um, yes. I, I would absolutely support a, a, a motion or whatever to, <laughs> to uh, make math a priority. Uh, and, and literacy, I think math and literacy should both be priorities in our, in our teaching blocks. But, like you said, I, I think you can teach literacy in some ways, inter, uh, in interdependent, uh, interdisciplinary ways, but I, math has to have its own time, so. I'd be curious to see, you know, we have the curriculum that we're trying to get through in each year. Like, how much of that curriculum are we actually getting through? You know, like, if, if we're seeing it, this drop in scores is that because we only got through 70% of what we were trying to get through for the year. And then how do we make sure we get through 100%? Like, is, are we getting through what we're trying to get through and the kids just aren't getting it or yeah. are we not getting through what we're trying to get through? And so we're falling behind. You know, there's a kind of two different potential issues. You know, are we teaching it and they're not getting it or are we going too slowly, which, you know, yeah. I think we could look into that.
Yes, I know. I know some of that work was done this summer with our, some of our interventionists as they were looking. I think a little bit more at the elementary level to start. So I will also um, circle up again with um, Bonnie Bourne and see how the process they looked at and how it's helping so far. Uh, and I know our middle school, a selected number of our middle school math um, teachers met yesterday to be looking again at the at our proficiencies and really making sure that we are targeting sort of the the right um, critical, uh, you know priority performance indicators as the as the state likes to call them. Um, and so that's a conversation that they had yesterday afternoon. And I think that will also um, contribute to what um, Andrew's saying too about making sure that right our, we are um, we are staying sort of on pace and hitting all of the content areas that we need to, um, or whether right we are we are hitting them, but we um, the students aren't quite getting them. I think that's a I mean I think it's a great question for us to continue to to dig into um, across uh, Kind of all the all the grade levels, but particularly looking now at that you know at that at those upper elementary and the middle school grades. Um, so th did that sound like that for the next meeting? Maybe well, that Jamie was going to look in to see if we could make this happen for, I guess, the second half of the year. Is that is that kind of what we were yeah, certainly, talking about here? Yes, or? I can come back. Yeah. <clears throat> With the principal and report out where we're at and whether or not a change is possible. But like this year, you added minutes to the math program this year. So we had one definitely at the yet. elementary level. Okay. We didn't get as so, far as we would have liked to, to have gotten at the middle school level. I mean, obviously, if you're not getting through all the material, you need more time on it. But, yeah. Um, I guess it will be interesting to see how things look in the winter, whether we're gaining or holding steady or, you know, like this report definitely makes it look like we're kind of going in the wrong direction, but it is kind of looking fall to fall. So that would be, you know, it's not necessarily what's happening this year. It's what happened over the previous full year. And so I guess. The only challenge is if we wait for the winter data. Yes, of course. And by that time, you can't make any adjustments, right? I mean, because you don't get those spring time. Yeah, yeah so the year's over then. And it's it seems like either. we have far enough to go that even if we overcorrected, that's not necessarily a bad thing, you know? Right. Like. Well, I would make a motion um, that that the board vote to support um, an explicit focus on math. Um, at least at the elementary and middle school levels um, for the time being. And um, I, I think that we're focusing on ELA at su summary. I will leave that out for the moment, but, but that we focus on math um, and that every student should be taking a math course and not just getting that in an interdisciplinary way. Um, so what's the motion? Um, like, is that, that what we you had in mind, Jamie? Or I, I was really, I was, I was really looking for the board to give a directive to the administration to dig in and come back with a proposal of how we plan to address these concerns, both in the near term, meaning this year, but also in the future. Um, uh, does that sound good? Okay. So, but I, do we need an I official think, motion I think I think both. I, sure. I think that um, that you said that there is pushback against explicit math instruction, and I, I think that that is unwarranted given this. I think it's, it, it might be the explicit amount of minutes. Yeah. Um, because there's just competing interests, and again, I'm not saying this critically. I think it could be taken that way. Uh, I think that there's competing interests that can happen. And I think we have not gotten to be able to get to a sweet spot around math instruction that we would like to see across all grade levels. And so I think if, if the board would give a directive to the administration to come to address that, that concern, the concern in math, both in the near term and the future, that would give us the tools to say, we need to relook at this. Yeah. And I, so I would move, I would move that. I'll second it. <laughs> yeah, we want to see more math. 
Yes. So yeah, I'll amend the motion that we want to see a plan to address these results um, as soon as possible in the near and, and okay. long term. So yeah, Shannon had made a motion, so we'll have her motion be amended and second. Yeah. Second. 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 Okay. second. All right. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Motion passes. We have an official directive. Thanks. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. No, you're on. No, no, I don't know if you did. I don't know if I was being overly clear. Okay. Uh, so we'll move on to the business manager report. Tara, with us. Tara, are you with us? Not yet. She's still going as Sharon. I didn't see her on the list. She was going to join us in person. Oh. Sharon Bay had just ended, and then she's driving here. Um, but she'll be with you for the budget presentation. But you have a report. She has all the, the meeting dates. I will say one of the things that was really excited that I was going to let her share was we did, you saw it in my report, and it had to do with the use of ESSER three funds for the plan work we have upcoming for the heating system and HVAC. We got approval today from the Agency of Education to move forward with a sole That's source, right. which I don't even know if Eric knows that yet. I see Eric from Laf Eric Lafayette here with us from EEI, who's gonna have a presentation tonight for you. So that's really exciting news, because um, it allows us to access, we've now been approved to access those funds for those, um, for those projects as a sole source. So that, that's good news. Concept approval is still awaiting for each each concept, but I, I fully expect that those will be approved because it really is to improve HVAC and, yeah. and things of that nature. So I'm not, I was more concerned about the sole source um, piece of it. So that was good. Um, and then I can take any questions about the dates in Tara's report that you may have in regards to reporting. Um, I do know she met with the auditors two weeks ago um, and that we're expecting that we will have draft audits to you here within the next two months to take action, or sorry, a final audit, audit to take action on by your January meeting at the latest, and that she expects fund balances to be confirmed by no later than your December meeting um, from last year. Um, and so that's the report I can give you on the audit as well. Our end is done, we're just waiting on the auditors to finalize that. Great. Okay. Um, policy committee. Policy on board protocol and code of ethics. Did the policy committee? Hasn't talked about. It. I just put it on there. So um, one of the things that's that's come up is that we we adopt the VSBA code of ethics, and some of our district boards have adopted board policies and procedures for how they govern themselves. They're a little different across the SU, in that. There seems to be a willingness and a desire, I think, at this point for the SU Policy Committee to consider what would a policy look like on board protocol procedures and, and code of ethics. Um, and so I'm going to be working on getting a draft to the Policy Committee on that um, for their December meeting. Their November agenda is already booked. Um, and the other update, Ronnie, you can fill any gaps I may miss. The Policy Committee did take up the conversation of a flag policy. The committee um, has requested that our legal counsel join the policy committee next Tuesday from 5 to 6. There's going to be a redrafted flag policy that is specific to the flying of the U.S. and Vermont flag in front of our buildings, but also to provide procedures within the policy that allows for a space that's identified with each of our schools, within each of our schools, to allow for the hanging of other flags and or banners that students have proposed to administration to want to um, convey um, something that they're, that's, they're passionate about. And so there's gonna be a policy that encompasses both of those concepts shared with the board, the policy committee. Um, next Tuesday, that was the, the wish of the policy committee after receiving feedback from all of our district boards. Right. Did I get that all right, Ronnie? That sounds about right. I think it's a two, two separate policies, a flag policy. I think the plan was, is to en encompass both. Okay. That there's a flag policy that also addresses banners, and it'll talk about banners 
So well, within yeah, clubs and groups can express themselves with banners, but not on the flagpoles. But I haven't seen the draft of the policy yet. So no, we'll I see. haven't either. <laughs> Our legal counsel's developing it. Okay. Any questions for the policy committee? No, I'm just trying to get it on my calendar. <laughs> so, yeah, anyone that's interested, public and board, the policy committee will meet next Tuesday from 5 to 6 at the SU office and virtually. Okay. All right. Uh, the full board update. Um, so at our full board retreat, um, we were talking about setting up a um, board mentoring program. So when new members join the board, having some um, board members with some experience uh, be mentors for them and kind of give them some um, help in acclimating to the board and, and you know learning how to become productive board members. Um, so it, we haven't really specified how that's going to look, but um, I think we uh, were going to be setting up a committee to kind of figure that out. So. Um, one of the things for the that we should come to the next board meeting for would be people who would be interested in being mentors and also interested in figuring out how the mentor program would look like. Um, does anybody have any thoughts on that? Anybody interested in volunteering? No, my schedule's pretty full. I I would, I don't know. I, I mean, I was at the meeting. I think a lot of things are good ideas. I just don't, you know, a lot of us are pretty stretched as it is on sure. different committees, and I think I think there are other committees that need to be filled before the mentoring one. But yeah. um, and then us being down a member right now, you know, we we're all on at least one committee now. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. Yeah, I think the idea with the mentor thing is that it's not necessarily a separate committee. It's something where you're meeting one-on-one -on -one with somebody for lunch right. or something like that and just talking once a month or something like that. So hopefully not a huge time commitment. Um, but uh, anyway, I guess think about it, and then we can, uh, if, if, you, if people are able to make the Monday and then Tuesday, next, next week's full board meeting. Um, that's where we'll discuss it further, I think. Um, the other thing that's happening at the uh, full board level is um, the full board goals. Um, so SU board goals. And the idea with those was, um, you know, we have our superintendent goals, which are kind of Jamie's priorities for where the um, you know, how his leadership, the, his goals for his leadership. And so the idea was, was that we should have separate goals, which maybe support Jamie's goals, mm -hmm. but also provide goals for where we want to be as an SU board and how we can support Jamie and also, you know, provide guidance and leadership for the SU as a whole to the best of our ability. So. Um, if you haven't, did everybody see those goals as I think those went out um, to the SU mm -hmm. members? So, would have um, been, yeah, a while ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but they'll go back them, out in the packet again Thursday right. for the SU board. Um, so, if anybody has any feedback on those, either let me know or um, bring them to the board meeting on Tuesday. All right, um, task force updates. Um, we can start with financial task force. We didn't, we're going to be meeting on this Thursday. Um, we had to delay, uh, Tara had a conflict, so we pushed back a week. So financial task force is not, not met. Um, other task forces? 
Um, the recruitment task force has not met. Kate has had to cancel um, for various reasons. Um, I'm hoping that gets up and running again soon, um, but it sounds like there's some great recruitment efforts going on, um, even though we're not talking about them. Um, and then the, the child care task force has not met um, recently. I will say the other uh, committee that I'm on would be the negotiations committee and we are starting to just talk um, we have our first meeting Tomorrow. this week <laughs> forget which week right. it is Sorry, Thursday, Thursday. It's, it's not Wednesday yet Jamie um, yeah so Thursday we have our first meeting and we will be doing the support staff um, at this time so stay tuned All right. Thanks, Anna. Um, and facilities will be talking about the yeah and we've got a tour set up too uh, in a couple weeks to do walk through on the buildings but you'll hear more about the why of that here in a few minutes okay well, should we move into that yeah let's do it all right move to the EI proposed summer yeah. of 2023 heating it's back lighting patrol at red schools hey guys how you doing I'll try to be quick tonight and just give you an update on where we're at on the project um, I think Jamie mentioned, um, you know, getting that sole source letter from the AOE is a big step. Um, at this point in the project, we have mechanical drawings complete. Electrical drawings are finishing up as we speak, um, and we're finalizing some civil um, locations of our um, storage silo and underground propane tanks. Um, pricing is coming in as the drawings are getting developed. Um, overall, I, I feel good about the budgets that we originally shared um, with you guys a couple months ago. Um, it's looking like those budgets are, are looking pretty good that they should be coming in pretty much in line with what we had originally carried. Some numbers are up, some are down, but overall it looks like the total number um, is looking pretty good. Some other news that we're working with right now, um, it's just um, one of the major components of our project is financing the energy savings. So um, what we do is we help communities go out and um, finance these projects with the energy savings that are um, going to be realized through the fuel switch, the controls upgrades, and the other performance upgrades that we're doing at the schools. Um, before, we were anticipating about a 4% interest rate on that loan. Um, that interest rate has gone up to about 4.5%. Um, it sounds pretty confident that that rate um, will probably stay about that through the end of this year. Um, they have better rates, obviously, than what you see on the market right now. Um, but one of the things that Jamie and I were talking about, what we're doing with other districts, um, is trying to get another task force meeting, a facilities task force meeting, and go over the drawings again um, and just go over the projects with the idea that we can get into real in-depth conversations about what the actual scope is um, with the idea that that task force could come back to the, to the school board and essentially either recommend what project they want to move forward with. Um, but at this time, you know, we are looking at doing the full conversion at Bethel. We just completed um, some additional asbestos testing there that I just got the reports back on today. So that's actually looking good. Um, and then um, we are meeting back out there again later this week with some structural engineers to look at the rooftop equipment at Royalton. So with the Royalton, we're looking at um, HVAC design for both the cafeteria, new ventilation equipment there and also the library. Um, both of those units would incorporate dehumidification um, and those designs are moving forward as well. So we have some drawings that I'd be able to share with people if we wanted to set up another meeting and go over them. Um, but ultimately that's what my proposal, hopefully I can get on the docket in December um, and present it to you guys. Um, if not, if it's January, that's not the end of the world. Um, we are still looking at a 20 to 24 week lead time on our equipment. So if we're releasing this in January, I'm anticipating it showing up mid to end of May, um, which would work out really well for our schedules. So overall, it's going well. Um, we're you know kind of crossing our T's, dotting our I's with the state on different grants um, and different ESSER requirements. Um, but that stuff is going out the door. And at the same time, um, we're kind of finalizing pricing with um, local subcontractor groups in the area. So. Go ahead. Eric, I don't know if you've seen your email yet. Yesterday, I suggested a bunch of meeting dates and times 
for each of yeah. our districts. I don't know if that date works for you or not, but Rudd was one of those. I can work. I mean, I'm going to be there that whole week, so um, I'll move stuff around to make whatever time you guys can make work. But my kind of thought was, okay. you know, we literally bring the drawings. We meet at Bethel. Um, once we get done at Bethel, we drive over to Royalton and, you know, we walk through each school. I show you exactly where the equipment is going to go, um, what you could see or expect for work. Um, and hopefully at that point, um, you guys are comfortable with what the scope of work would be. Um, and then we would be probably meeting back again in maybe like a week or two, probably just before um, your next board meeting of when you would want me to present. And at that time, I would kind of show you guys all of the final schedule of values on the project. Um, and hopefully it comes back to that at or below that original budget. And one of the things I'm doing with my project is I am, I do have some different items on it, kind of what we call alternates on the project, where we can either add or delete them from the project if it's within you know the budget or above or below the budget so i'm just going to try to show you guys as much information as possible when we meet and really let you guys make the decisions of you know how much you guys want to dip into the capital reserves or um you know is it does it make sense to cut back on the scale of the project at this time okay does anybody have any questions all right thank you look forward Good luck, to guys thank month. you all right, on to budgets. So in the packet, you have draft two of your student support budget and draft one of your general education. So on draft two of student support, the only change that was made was I updated the health insurance rate increases based on the rates that were released to us by VHI that they have submitted to the Department of Financial Regulation for review and approval. And then as you may recall, your benefits um, for all of our staff are negotiated at the state level. So they made a funding change to the HRA for professional staff effective in January. So I've made those adjustments in the HRA funding. So that's all that changed in draft two of the student support. And then draft one, I'll just briefly go over it and then the principals can chime in on the details behind it. So this is only looking at the salary and benefits for those and the different um, function codes in your budget. And draft one for regular elementary, it's updated per your current staffing and adding a 1.0 FTE. It reduces PE to your current staffing of 2.5, which is a reduction of 0.5 FTE. Reduces foreign language to your current staffing of 1.4, which is a reduction of 0.6 FTE. Increases global citizenships from 3.6 FTE to 4.6 FTE. Increases driver's ed from 0.5 to 1.0. And then increases um, the work-based learning from a 0.8 to a 1.0. And I'll just jump in real quick before the principals add. Um, a majority of this is reconciling where we are currently are and what we're feeling like we need for staffing. Um, when you see things like the global studies and when you see things like what we're currently at with PE, um, the, and also in regards to the foreign language. That was my question. And so, and so that's where we're currently at. And so right now we have students accessing foreign language at the middle school because we weren't able to find a foreign language teacher for the middle school via a VTVLC. For, so for through Vermont virtual learning. Um, and so this budget proposes that we continue that method. Um, that's something that we're gonna need feedback on from the board about. And the other thing to know is um, in regards to why an additional elementary teacher, when you look at our current enrollment numbers, um, specifically at the Royalty campus, um, we underestimated where we would currently have enrollment to be at the kindergarten le level right now. That's a good problem to have. Um, and so this would give us an additional elementary teacher for Andrew the, to then deploy. However, we best see the need. Um, and you may say, well, how does that number go down? Just remember that this budget figure incorporates all staff salaries and their benefits, right? So, and remember a family benefit plan is 25,000. So it is easy based on 
when changing of staff if, they, if prior staff had a full family plan versus now a new hire just has a single plan or they don't take insurance that can adjust that budget figure significantly so i just wanted to be able to answer that question of how can you add someone but see that budget line go down that would be the reasoning as to why so like global citizenship and some of those where we added a full time but it went down by a percentage that was Correct. bennies and things like that yeah yeah because that's all figured in to that that figure you're seeing right now um and so you know overall across the two you know we're still up over three hundred thousand um as you look at staffing and that's purely staffing next month just a reminder you'll see every budget line as fun as far as your function budget um so when you think about operations the fact that we know we want to continue to i hope to contribute to our reserve funds in regards to um, prioritizing getting our reserve funds um, built up around strategic planning around deferred maintenance things of that nature that will all come into your next round of budgeting too and um, I don't know Andrew if you want to hit on anything else that I didn't mention you know I can't the foreign language again I really looked to the principals to make these recommendations so I can't speak to that reduction completely other than I supported it enough to bring it to you and so because the principals the first step of the budgeting process principals meet with Tara and I and they really speak to how is staffing going to support their work and programming at their building level so an example would be Andrew you know advocating that an additional elementary teacher is needed I certainly agree with that based on our current numbers um, and you know principal bradley advocated that he felt like foreign language could be addressed via vtvlc and so i felt comfortable enough to bring that to you for consideration is the vtvlc something that individual students are doing as a flexible pathway or is it yes okay it's not like that is my understanding does yeah <laughs> Those that wanted to pursue foreign language were able to do it through a pathway. I would also say, I think one of the things we've struggled with, frankly, and it's not just here, is performing arts teachers and foreign language teachers seem to be a real area, well, in special ed, luckily, knock on wood, we're, we've done whole right in that department here, recruiting. But I would tell you that performing arts teachers and foreign language is a significant concern and I've got vacancies in foreign language across three districts right now. Um, and so it just seems to be an area with these part-time positions. You would think what we did before is we did add them all up into a 1.0. I think the challenge is the geographical nature of SU, RSU makes that challenging, meaning teaching foreign language in Stockbridge, Rochester, Sharon, and Bethel, which is what we were doing, poses a challenge to make a 1.0 position um the so what i want the board to know is that we advertise all summer in both those part-time and the full-time to see like is there somebody that wanted a part-time position or no i really wanted the full-time position with benefits and so we did advertise them in those different ways um and so that is something to consider i think if foreign language is something that we wanted to pursue it really may be one of those things where as a district you need to increase it to 1.0 in order for us to attract a high quality candidate just to be straight up with you about that i think that that's part of what we're facing is that some of these part-time positions can be challenging so the reduction of the half of a pe i know there's been a little bit of a hot topic at the middle school level this year where we reduce some of the instructional pe time um, and replace some of that with some of the outdoor ed. Um, so the reduction of a half of position, is that going to reduce the PE time at all, or we're going to stay the same? It then? would stay the same. Okay. Um, yeah, I think with the foreign language, yeah, I'm definitely torn on it because that was one of the things we kind of added with the merger to try and take advantage, you know, like provide more and you know, I think the younger levels are where they learn the quickest, but my sense is that we're running into the time of the day and like providing quality instruction in elementary and middle school while also dealing with our test score 
you know, like math instruction and time and all that stuff. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm okay with going forward with this. It would be nice to have high quality foreign language instruction, but I think our priority needs to be on getting our core subjects solid. Um, the driver's ed number seems high for a one FTE. That is a figure that we've been using with family plan in the event that we have to hire an experienced educator, it wouldn't come in high. And when you look at the top of our salary schedule and our family benefits, and that's how we've been budgeting um, for this coming school year, specifically when we think about driver's ed, it is one of those, that is another position where the state is really short it's also why we're budgeting at 1.0. Um, and we're currently right now, um, our athletic and activities director is doing us a favor by continuing to fill that position part-time. Um, it is not an ideal approach that we wanna do as we wanna look to continue to expand activities within the district. I really want that focus to be on that 1.0 position, but Mr. Perot is helping us because he's a licensed um, driver's ed teacher too. Um, and as we look to expand the high school, I think having one of the selling points, I do believe that we should be marketing, and I think Principal Thomas is doing this, is that we are able to provide our students driver's ed. And some, some of the high schools around us are not able to. Um, and so we think about the ability to recruit a driver's ed teacher um, and have them in place is important um, and make certain our kids can access it. And I also believe that we're in order to do that, we're probably looking at someone who is a real veteran on our salary scale versus someone who may have limited experience just because driver's ed seems to be a licensing area where folks aren't going into it. That was gonna be a question I had is, is there the ability to partner with an outside source to provide the service without having to come with all that? the full bennies and stuff, you know? Yeah, we, we, we tried to do that, and their timing is uh, in the afternoons only, so there are a lot of private drivers and classes or instructors, and so they, they can come from like three to five, and we found that a lot of our, our students are involved with extracurricular activities from three to five, whether they're working or whatnot. So we, when we didn't have anybody before Tim stepped up, we called the state and the state sent out all the information to all the people that are driver's ed certified. And we got maybe two calls and they were calls that said that I'm teaching, I'm instructing and I'll be at Woodstock on this night and Bradford on that night. And that meant our kids had to travel to go to those classes. Mm -hmm. And again, I think that's what some of our competing schools are doing, Thetford, Sharon Academy and so forth. So when Tim decided he would take that position, it was pretty, pretty, pretty good. So. And Chris, we've had this discussion at the board level um, before, and just, just to point out that um, it's a significant cost for some of these families who are sending their kids to share, and they desperately kind of wanted to make a deal and come over <coughs> here, and we said, no, we've got, <laughs> got too many kids, we have to teach to drive here. So. I think that it is a, a recruiting tool and, and something we should be um, still supporting. Um, it's something that a lot of our surrounding towns are a little bit jealous of. No, my comment wasn't eliminating it. It, yeah. was, it was the opportunity to have someone sure. that you, right. so I'll make it up. Instead of paying someone with full bennies $100,000 a year to do it, could we contract with somebody that might charge us $75,000 a year that would come in and still provide the same services. Mm. An independent contractor. Right. You know, uh, then you don't have to get into paying, you know, $25,000 with the benefits. So and the, the only way we could do that is if we couldn't secure someone because the driver's ed teacher is a uh, bargaining member of our CBA. Mm -hmm. But this year we were in a jam, so it would open up the ability for us to try to use a contracted service for that. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, that is a licensed educator in the state, so we would have to move forward with filling that position. Do you think, like, in the ideal <laughs> world, how many FTEs do you think is appropriate for, like, would you want a full-time full driver's ed instructor 
given the demand and number of students that we'd be serving, or like as a halftime appropriate? I think it's in between, I th and I don't want to speak for Jeff. It seems like right now we're getting by with about, we figured about 0.5 to 0.6-ish, yes. depending on the time of the year and driving schedules. The hope is that we continue to grow our high school around the recruitment efforts. And also what we've been doing in the ideal world with a full-time driver's ed, which I think we're still somehow making it happen right now, although I worry in the future that it could become an issue, is also offering driver's ed for our students who access the tech center. Um, because we, what we didn't, in the past, Randolph was able to service some of their tech center students um, via driver's ed that we sent, but they're also struggling in driver's ed, so they didn't have capacity to serve receiving students. They go to the tech center. So the idea would be that we also could continue to serve our tech center students. I would say to you this, I, th I would recommend that we, if we have the ability, this is one of those things when we see the full budget in December, and if you're not feeling good about where the yield's lining up, right, in our bottom line budget, this is an area that I could see us as administration going back and saying we could trim. I think right now we're presenting to you ideally what we could do, with the idea being that we want to try to recruit someone to do it. Um, yeah, my other question was how much education does somebody need to take in order to be a licensed driver as a teacher? Well, they need to educate a license, but to add that endorsement, it's actually not that hard meaning that the higher ed collaborative the vermont higher ed collaborative has created a sequence of courses for folks to take in order to get that endorsement the difference with that endorsement versus others is of course they're providing the teaching toward a licensure and so it's not an endorsement that i can go get provisionally license someone which makes sense right like they're teaching someone how to be in a machine that could cause bodily harm to someone or other people. So, meaning, if I had a teacher interested in it, we would fully support them getting licensed. And there is a course way, there is a sequence of courses to take in order to do so. Um, it takes about a year. Um, what I can't do is hire someone who has a teaching degree in a different area and get them a provisional or emergency sure. like I can other content areas. Has, has that been communicated to our current staff of anybody that might be interested in yes. pursuing I don't want to lose any elementary yeah, teachers to drivers at. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, when we were looking before Tim decided, it was able to step in, yes, the teachers were asked, and, the, and we laid out what the program was that they needed to take classes for. Jim Hewitt was interested, but he decided not to. Yeah. Good thing. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, any other comments on the, or feedback on the first draft of the general education budget? Um, what was the global citizenship increased by one? We, that's just what that's current about. FTE. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's based on, we've got um, some folks that are dual licensed, and it's based on their actual FTE breakdown of what they're teaching right now. Okay. Yeah, Meaning we, English versus social. Uh, we have some folks licensed in both. I think we have one who's teaching foreign language and that's yes, correct. Well, so. Does the uh, foreign language reduction kind of reflect that? No. Okay. All right. Um, thank you. I guess we we'll look forward to seeing the full. Yeah, and stay tuned. I mean, I'm not, I don't know if Tara's hearing anything. I've heard zero thus far on any predictions around yield. Are you hearing anything? It was not. It's not at VASCO at all. VASCO on Friday. So just meaning, you know, remember the yield really impacts our tax rate um, around the statewide property tax. So uh, that piece is what really creates that statewide tax. So um, stay tuned because that's a huge thing for us. And we get. First estimate December first. Yeah, December. usually there's a little scuttlebutt about it, mm -hmm. but I haven't heard anything. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, moved on to appointment. Um, so um, Shannon has been our vice chair and board clerk. Um, she had to step off the board when she moved from Bethel to Royalton and then was reappointed. So 
Um, those positions are technically vacant right now, um, so we need to appoint a vice chair and board clerk. So, um, would anybody like to volunteer or nominate for those positions? Well, the uh, vice chair is supposed to be from the opposite town as a chair. That's um, in the bylaws, I believe. I I think traditionally that's what we've done. Yeah, we've traditionally done that. I don't mm -hmm. know that it's been in. I don't see in your articles of yeah. agreement. Right. That's what I know. I thought it was, but I'd have to check. I, the last time I checked your articles of agreement was remember when we talked about the elementary conversation, um, which I need to give you guys an update on next mm -hmm. month when I check those because there was some interesting information in there about the conversation about elementary. In the from the articles of agreement. Yeah. Okay. But I don't remember seeing that writing when I read it through. It doesn't mean it's not there. It's just yeah, it certainly has been kind of like initially we were going to have the board chair position swap um, swap town every year, basically. Right. Um, but I think we value the consistency of having somebody, you know, with experience and Lisa did a good job. So she had the position until she stepped off the board and we haven't, um, you know, I've had it since. So I don't know that we're necessarily doing that uh, per se. I think we're just, um, if, if this is a discussion at this point of what makes the most sense. I mean, if we feel that we need to have a balance, which I don't know if we necessarily do or not, but I'd be willing to help out as as vice chair um, until March, I guess, because who knows what happens in March, but. Well, we'll do a reorganization meeting and the meeting after anyway and vote for those all over again. Right. 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 So I guess, I mean, I, my, my thoughts are, yeah, we always did the chair was from one town and the co-chair from the, the opposite town. So and I'm not interested in being the chair or co-chair, vice chair. That's driver's ed teacher, right? Oh, well, I'll make the driver's ed teacher. I might consider a driver's ed teacher. Yeah, right. uh, <laughs> but, it's going to be in a big uh, truck, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I need a, so since I'm not interested, I would nominate Chris as uh, being the co uh, vice chair. I would second that. Okay. Um, all right. Any discussion? Not. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, Chris, you're the vice chair. Aye. <laughs> Just make sure you keep coming to the meetings, Andrew. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think um, I've had to run one yeah. the whole time. <laughs> no getting sick. It's been more, uh, more whenever coaching intervenes. Um, all right, board clerk. Yeah, I have even less interest in being a board clerk. <laughs> uh, no, the chair. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I would nominate Shannon as board clerk. Thanks. Should we make that so it has to alternate each year? Doing that? Board clerk one? <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that one. Okay, do we have a second for Shannon as board clerk? Sure, I'd second that. Okay. All in favor of Shannon as board clerk? Say aye. Uh, Bye. Okay. Thank God for Tammy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who takes all our minutes? I just have to review them the next day. Okay. All right. So we're taking care of that. Thank you, everybody. All right. We don't have any um, action items at the moment. Um, new hires, resignations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we're on to the second public comment period. Um, is there anybody who? Like to make a public comment? Question. Okay, would um, just repeat your Gene name. Gene Krause. Gene Krause. Bethel. Yep. Uh, did I understand from the minutes of the October meeting that the uh, LGBTQ policy will be considered next month or yeah, Tuesday? So I, I was confused about next Tuesday with the policy committee versus. Wasn't a policy. So clarification. So, so the, wasn't a policy. Yeah, it wasn't a policy. It was a board resolution, which is just the board kind of stating something. 
um, not an official policy that the administration, you know, directs the administration or something that needs to be followed. Um, so Shannon had, had proposed it last time, and um, it, we tabled it for this meeting, and I didn't get it onto the agenda, so we're putting it into next month. So that's that okay. my goal. It's a resolution in support of our LGBTQ plus uh, students and staff. Just um, It does not change any current policy. Right. So, but it's an already existing policy. We already have we already have policies around non-discrimination, but this is just a resolution that said the board stands with our students and staff who identify in that manner. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca. Hi. Um, I'm Rebecca Stone. I'm a Bethel parent with a middle schooler and an elementary kid. And I wanted to pass along two comments. One is actually from my fourth grader, Eliza, who was shy and not able to say this on the microphone in the first comment period. So she typed it in. But she was extremely excited to hear about the electric bus grant and read the article in the Herald and really said she hopes that the SU will accept that grant and institute electric buses to help with climate change in the planet. So that was her comment. Um, one for me as well, I'm, I'm so grateful for all the great work happening in so many corners of the school, actually all the schools. Um, as an elementary parent and a middle schooler though, I do wanna say a lot around academics is challenging for us. Both of my kids have wanted more challenge over the years and we've struggled to get it. We know it's really, really hard to teach to kids of all different levels to deal with pandemics and everything that's going on. And we're grateful for so much hands-on learning and experiential ed too. Um, but I will say we definitely have concerns about this, especially in the middle school, having just gone through parent conferences, I walk away and feel like I have no idea how my child is doing academically in classes. There's no room in the reporting process that we sought through at least to really hear how they're doing, where they're struggling, where they need more support, where they're doing really well. We do hear that um, there's not a lot of input even getting to the kids in some classes about what they're doing. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of rigor. So I would just love to ask whether there's more that could be done even within the instructional time that exists to make sure that kids are really being challenged at whatever level they're at um, and to make sure that all of our kids are getting challenged. I'm not quite sure the best way to approach this conversation. Um, there's a lot more detail we'd be happy to share whether the best format is a letter or a longer comment. Um, and the last comment I'll make is I'm also disappointed to hear that there won't be a foreign language position or at least not in the budget right now at middle school. I have a middle schooler who loves language and was so excited to learn again. She takes both band and chorus, which means she doesn't have flexible pathways time in her schedule. So there's no pathway for her to really find out about that as an option or to see where she might be able to fit language into her schedule. And that feels like a big gap. Thanks. Thank you. Um, go ahead. Yeah, hi, I was here to observe tonight and I came to um, support any conversations we had about our LGBTQ plus community. My name is Dana, um, my student, I have a child who goes to school in district. I'm a community member. I'm also a special educator at Stockbridge in Rochester and I help with the equity coordination here. And I couldn't help but say something when you were talking about math in elementary schools being um, at the forefront. Um, and I would like to say it's really important for board members to come into our schools and see what's going on in our schools because that's how you get to know um, how hard our teachers are working and how hard our students are working. So I wrote down a couple of things. I know I only have three minutes, but. What I see at the schools that I work at um, are teachers trying to teach across the board. We're shorthanded. Um, I have at Stockbridge, I witness and observe on a daily basis um, a teacher teaching fourth, fifth, and sixth grade Bridges math, um, and that's really hard to do. Um, 
especially when you're talking about quality education. Um, and I agree with what Jamie said, you can't pull out of direct instruction to get interventions because then you're missing and you're just creating more gaps and that doesn't work. Um, and I also would like to say at, at Rochester, um, again, there's um, you know a teacher short and we have one teacher teaching third, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade math. And I see Lindy constantly trying to figure out how to make everything work so we have quality education. So it's not that our kids aren't getting math. <laughs> they are getting math and we are doing the best that we could do, but it's really hard right now. So I could not just sit here and not say that. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. We'll say, from our perspective, it's how can we support and you know push to make it easier for the staff to be able to do, do their jobs. So. Um, Michelle. Hi, I just to uh, kind of piggyback what Becky was just saying. Um, also, middle school parent. Uh, my name is Michelle Sama. I um, have three kids, elementary and two in middle school. Um, I, I just I feel like one of the challenges that might not be seen from looking at the the data and the charts is are there other issues outside of the teaching that are interfering with students being able to, to learn and to advance? Um, it does seem as though there's a lot of waiting for kids that are meeting the standard or doing their work. And um, that's time that I see as, as also preventing them from moving forward. And so I, I just wonder if, um, if there's some issues in the classroom not related to the academics that are interfering with these core subjects from being taught and from being learned. And I don't know if that's something that we can work on that doesn't require additional staffing or, I mean, I, I'm probably speaking very naive about this, but um, I would love to see more rigor and I would love to see students that want to learn um, to be able to learn all the time instead of um, when it's on the same time frame as the rest of the class um, or for a few students. Thank you. Um, is there anybody else who'd like to speak at this time? Um, my name is Suzanne Long. Um, I haven't had kids in the school for a while, <laughs> but. Um, I do remember when they were in school, I, I farm, um, so in the winter I was more available. Um, and I offered several years to see if there was a place for community involvement to, you know, to lend a hand. And, and there wasn't. Um, I don't know if that's changed. I don't know if there is a way um, to um, enable interested community members to maybe, you know, be in a classroom to, uh, you know, even help kids go through some of their math problems, um, uh, you know, just to be that uh, another adult while the te main teacher is working in a pod with the rest of the group. You know, I know that, anyway, um, does the do you have you guys considered, or you do you already do that? I'm not. I haven't. I've been so busy. No, you're right. No, I, <laughs> so I, I've been asking for people to consider subbing, and yeah. sometimes we'll use subs that way, and or volunteer. And so, part of what I think is special right now, and why I think the middle school after school programming is working, is there's been a lot of community volunteers coming in to offer programming, and so I would say that's a way to get the foot in the door but i would tell you that if you have any interest in serving our students and our schools please reach out and know that we would love to have you and i'll just follow as an employer and a farmer the whole math thing drives me crazy i have employees that have a hard time you know, figuring out, okay, we have this many pounds of carrots and we have to divide it up amongst 30 shares. I, I end up having to do so much really basic 
problem solving because those young folks, I mean, they're in their 20s, They've been out of school for a long time, and they didn't go to South Royalton necessarily. So it's not, this is a pretty universal thing. At farmer's market, people who, can't students who can't change. make change. Can't make change. It is so hard as an employer. I have to do so many more pretty basic things. Um, so, and you know, just hearing you say that it's hard to integrate math, boy, math is in every moment of my life. How can you not integrate math? <laughs> I think it's, what I was trying to say is, I think it's hard to provide explicit instruction yeah. through the integration. Yeah. I think that math is one of those things that you really have to have a student understand the conceptual understanding behind what a fraction is. Okay. And I think that just takes explicit teaching in time. Because yeah. I think in general, it, it, it is something that we let, what, and I think COVID shined the light on this. I think in general, the English language in co oral comprehension and reading tends to be in a majority of our households, right? We have conversation, even if it's about something orally, I think in general, we don't have conversation about math. Mm -hmm. As much, definitely, maybe some households, yeah. but in general. Yeah. So I think what we find is, is without that explicit time to do it, that we, we have a really hard time providing that core conceptual understanding yeah. of it. That's what I was trying to get yeah. at. Yeah. Doesn't mean we can't also integrate, I think we should. I just think we need the explicit teaching on top of it. Is there anybody else for? Yep, go ahead. I have a real quick comment I just want to say as a volunteer at the Bethel Food Shelf, I can't tell you how thrilled people were to get those pies. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. I think they're doing pizzas at some point, too. We've I know my, pizzas, my fourth pizzas. grader is very <laughs> excited. So. We'll do pizzas again. <laughs> yeah. Um, Kate? So I... Kate Jarvis, I have two daughters, um, one in the middle school and one in the high school, seventh grade and ninth grade. Uh, just a couple questions or, or comments relating to, to the budget and the meeting tonight. So foreign language, I think I share the same concern as some other parents. And maybe I was not clear, but can you elaborate on what the current offerings are in the middle school for foreign language? Do we have a full-time teacher teaching foreign language? Is it just virtual? Yeah, so it's, it was budgeted for a 0.6 FTE at the middle school, which is what we've had previously. We haven't been able to fill that position. And so it's just virtual. So from experience, my daughter graduated in 2020. And she, I think when foreign language first came out as an electronic or virtual option, she really, after maintaining years of of good grades and honorable grades, she struggled with virtual foreign language. So it kind of makes me question again, how many current students are enrolled in virtual learning for, on, for foreign language? Do we know those numbers? The principal could answer that. I can't give you a, a factual number off the top of my head. I, think I as a member you know, of the community would support additional funds in that aspect. And then, uh, Andrew, you had commented about the after-school program. I think that they, they did used to help out with tutoring after school in math and language. So I remember Kaylee used to volunteer and help out with that. So I don't know if they're currently still doing that in the after-school program or not. Uh, we haven't started tutoring yet this year, but we always do offer tutoring through the after-school program. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. yeah I think foreign language might be a good thing for at the middle school, school, school club. Yeah. You know, if we aren't able to offer it in the midday. Um, That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Uh, anybody else? Yes. If I may, uh, my son, when he was in high school, ran through all the languages being taught at the high school, went to virtual, and thrived. Mm -hmm. So that. So whether it's virtual or in-person learning instruction is going to vary a great deal with an individual student. Uh, 
So virtual is not, while it may not be ideal, <laughs> it is certainly not the, uh, it's not something to just ignore mm -hmm. either. Um, Looked like somebody put something in the chat if you want to. Yeah, please. Mariah Cleveland, uh, middle school used to have a homework club after school. Sounds like there's some interest in bringing it back. Okay. Um, any other <coughs> public comment? Okay. Well, thank you everybody for coming out. Um, we're going to be going into executive session um, after this, and there shouldn't be any action taken afterwards. So, um, do appreciate everybody coming out. It's great to see people coming to the school board. Members. Thank you. Hi, Andrew, for the virtual session. Who's being invited to stay? Just um, what we need. I think just me. Just Jamie. Somebody want to make a motion? I'd make a motion that we go into executive session to discuss a personnel issue uh, with the superintendent. I'll second it. Right. Rodney seconded it. Thank you. Thanks, Have a good night. You too. Thanks, Tammy. Thanks.